Good afternoon. We're going to get the start meeting started. If you'd like to uh, continue your conversations, uh, if you could please take them outside. Uh, this, uh, the acoustics in here, the voices carry, so uh, it um, gets noisy fairly easy. I'm Councilmember Weezer. Uh, this is chair of the Planning and Land Use Management Committee, being joined by Councilmember Harris Dawson and Councilmember Englander. We'll get this meeting started. Um, First, uh, we'd like to uh, go through the consent calendar. And um, item two, we'll put on consent. Item six, we'll put on consent. Eight, we'll have on consent. Nine, we will have on consent. Ten, we will have on consent. So without any objection, we'll move those items on consent. Any objections? On six, Councilman. Yes. City Attorney will be requested to prepare the ordinance. Okay, we could ask... Uh, the city attorney with those directions to prepare an ordinance on number six. So ordered, items two, six, eight, nine, and ten on consent. Number 11, uh, we do have a couple of speaker cards, but we will continue that item to March 7th. Number 11 will be continued to March 7th. Number 12... will be continued to March 7th as well. And number 13th will be continued to April 4th. Do we need an action on that or we just continue them? Just That's the action. Okay, any objection to continuing those items? Seeing none, so ordered. So that gets us to Item, well, actually, we will start with a multiple items comment period. The multiple item comments are for those individuals who have signed up to speak for more than two items. They get an opportunity to address the committee um, in the beginning of the committee. Uh, the first person we have is Herman. Yeah, we all know what the Director of Planning and Oral Status Report is really all about. But the development of city planning policies, as I brought out this afternoon at 1 o'clock on the old business regarding Mr. Cervantes, the old CRA crap face, was the work programs, operations, and how dare you insult the public saying that you're, make, you're mixing the mixed use for our personal gain and needs. <laughs> That's right. I laugh about the bullshit too. That was item number one, fools. Then I'm going into my specific item. I believe that item regarding, actually that was a closed item, right? Item 12, the devil dwarf. So now going, on the structure of CD14, Cultural Heritage Commission, relative to the inclusion of Hotel Cecil, located at South Main Street. Another historic cultural monument that deserves row, row, row. What does row, row, row mean? It means I'm trying to rally you to understand that the Cultural Heritage Commission under Jose Huiza has failed to provide an impact statement like all the other impact statements ignored by the elected official in CD14, which is the chair here. Such 
arrogance, and ignorance is unacceptable and will not be tolerated when it comes to the char characteristics and the measure of quality of our cultural heritage in Boyle Heights. So on behalf of the public's interest and politically correct statement. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for blessing us with your presence at every one of these committee meetings and every council meeting. It's certainly entertaining. Item number one, report from Director of Planning, um, Vince Bartoni. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Weezer. I have no report today. No report today? Great. We'll receive and file item number one. Item number three, if that could be read into the record, please. Uh, sure. I, item three, Councilman, this is a city attorney report and a planning report uh, relative to the uh, marijuana issue and land use controls. Staff here to report on this item. Deputy City Attorney, I believe you have two reports there, uh, one from the Department of City Planning and there's a confidential report which is from the City Attorney's Office. Is the microphone on? Yes, if you could repeat that and speak into the microphone please. Testing, testing, is it on? It is on. You just have to speak straight directly into the microphone. This is uh, Steve Blau, Deputy City Attorney. I believe the committee has two reports. One is a confidential report uh, from the Office of the City Attorney. Uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have, which may be of a non-confidential um, nature. There's also a report before the committee from the Department of City Planning, and there is staff here from that department as well. Okay. Do we have any, uh, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I don't think it's on, but okay. Uh, I'm Tom Rothman from the Planning Department, and uh, we are reporting back on um, uh, a potential framework for a land use ordinance that will um, implement the Adult Use of Marijuana Act that was uh, approved by the voters last year. So uh, the report before you lays out certain parameters uh, that can be included into a land use zoning ordinance that could go into the municipal code and uh, there are no official recommendations here but we did highlight some of the key topics one of the topics would be to provide definitions that would go into the zoning code and into the city's official use list uh, right now we have identified those as outdoor cultivation indoor cultivation a marijuana processing facility marijuana storage and distribution facility marijuana store and marijuana testing facilities. So those are the ones that we've come up with right now, but those can be either increased or decreased as we move forward on this ordinance. We've also talked uh, briefly about potential buffering from sensitive uses, uh, similar to the way we uh, regulate Prop D facilities, Proposition D, medical marijuana. We've also talked about how we would appropriately zone all of these different uses and what types of zoning permissions we would provide and how we would analyze the the correct zones in terms of our current zoning system and, and in terms of our future zoning system with the Recode LA project. Uh, we talked briefly about limitations on the number of stores. Uh, we've outlined a list of deliverables that will help us um, further our analysis regarding basically maps uh, on sensitive uses and potential sites. And then we have outlined what our next steps should be, including an environmental clearance uh, in order for us to implement and adopt a citywide ordinance to implement the AUMA. Uh, I can go into more detail or I could just answer some questions. Um, okay. That concludes my presentation. All right, and for the record, we've been joined by Councilmember Price. Um, any questions or comments? Item number three. Uh, and again, this is, uh, these reports, or this report in front of us today lays out the game plan to begin the land use analysis that will aid us in the development of a holistic marijuana land use uh, regulation system. So it's just okaying our staff to go look at these items. Um, 
So any opportunity between, is this report going to council as well? City Clerk? This, this no. report is pending in PLUM and IGR. Okay, so we're gonna keep this here. So any uh, additional items you wish staff to review or examine, now's the time to say it. Mr. Price? Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the work that staff's done so far on this. This is uh, gonna be a big, uh, a big deal for everyone. Uh, in, in the discussions, uh, preliminary discussions we've had, there's been some concern about uh, some equity in the issuance of licenses. Is that going to be part of your discussion in terms of uh, uh, some, um, some potential uh, issues to consider? Uh, that might uh, not come into a land use ordinance. Uh, as far as I know, there is a there is a, a parallel track along with the land use ordinance with the city. Um, uh, developing some type of department or commission that would actually provide the licensing and the permitting of all of these facilities. We would just be setting up the parameters of where they're allowed to go and not to go and what the permissions levels would be. But as far as the licensing, that would not be done with the planning department. That would be done uh, outside of that and through a different, a different commission. Thank you. So our goal here then is to, for example, on the issue of capping the number of um, businesses, uh, we are looking to examine different types of parameters where they can locate, correct? Um, for example, um, certain feet away from sensitive uses, et cetera. So we may lay that out in the land use issue, but you know the AGR committee could come up with a cap regulatory system, then we'd have to work out when the final ordinance comes out what makes sense. But as far as we're concerned, we're more looking more at the land use issues and what types of characteristics. At the end of the day, we may come up with a default cap, just given how we regulate it and how far they have to be from each other, how far from sensitive uses. And we may see, uh, you know, if you look at our land use patterns, we could estimate as to how many would be allowed just based upon our land use regulations, correct? Correct, correct. Mr. Englander? Thank you. Thanks for uh, for all the work you're about to start doing and some more work on this. It, it, in looking at sort of going backwards, we had well, roughly 1,600 or so at one point at the height um, storefronts. I think we're down to about 850 or 900, somewhere around there. Uh, I really can't answer those. I don't have the information about how many we have. I, I know there's a number of 135 that are allowed to be there legally, or, uh, but uh, there are a number of illegal or unpermitted and unlicensed medical marijuana property yeah. facilities. Yeah. But I'm so, not, yeah, according but I'm to not some, aware of that number. Some of the ones that are actually online and or are part of the app, um, the different apps, Weed Maps and all the others, suggest there are about four to 500. And then there are a number of them that aren't. That have storefronts, and and um, and I think in going forward and looking at the rules and regulations, um, and however we end up drafting the the, the final uh, ordinances, we've got to look at a mechanism to shut the ones down faster, uh, somehow that uh, are not operating legally, and that's always the most difficult variable in this. It's always harder to shut down. In fact, it's harder to shut down something that's unlicensed in this city than it is for something that's licensed. Whether it's a group home, whether it's a marijuana facility, whether it's a storefront, any whatever it is, it's harder. A restaurant, anything that doesn't have a license, is harder to shut down than somebody's actually doing it and trying to do it legally with a license, whatever that might be. Uh, and 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 everybody scratches their head on that one. Um, and and it, but that's the biggest challenge we have. If there's something we can bake into this up front to figure out, because we there's no revocation process. You can't revoke something they're not authorized to have in the first place, and we end up doing circles around it. Right. Um, so maybe there's something we can do to work into this um, land use policy uh, that talks about the owners as well, the owner's responsibility um, for those unlicensed. I think we need to have a section specifically about the unlicensed facilities and moving on this. Um, and, um, you know, it took a couple of years just for the city attorney's office to legally navigate just because of the complexities um, and different case laws to send notices to even the owners that were renting 
the storefront. That's insanity. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that we work closely with the city attorney's office on this. Uh, and that would be my recommendation is to figure out how to front load some of that or front loading some of the requirements that they need sign off from the owners. I mean, there's got to be something that we can do to speed up that process on the back end for the illegal operators. Sure, and we did mention that when we do come back with either an ordinance or another report, we would talk specifically about enforcement, annual reporting, and uh, and our revocation procedures, whether that could work or not. And again, those are for license, right? We've got to figure out the unlicensed and, well, and, and a way to address well, that. Well, if somehow. they are not complying with their certificate of occupancy, I mean, I don't want to speak for the Department of Building and Safety and our CNAP pro program, but there are ways of uh, revoking a certificate of occupancy when they are not um, providing the use that is that is legally permitted. Sure, sure. So, so we could. So I would recommend that, um, that. that when we when this comes back, as we walk through the, go through this process, that's one of the most important <laughs> components of this. And we usually, since it's a, a separate department or a different process, don't mention those elements or items in the ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that we do, even if nothing more than a footnote. Um, so in cooperation and collaboration with building and safety and the city attorney's office to figure out how to how to put some of that language into this to, um, to at least outline and highlight those that are operating without a license or illegally um, and what would happen or could happen easily if to give us the tools faster that we've codified it in, in, in the code somehow. Uh, and I know it's a separate process and I know we have those processes but I think commingling them somehow um, carefully may make sense or at least behoove us to have the conversation. So I'd just ask that those be talked about. Okay. Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanna uh, thank uh, and associate myself with the comments of sure. uh, council members Price and Englander in particular uh, as it relates to enforcement. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the most maddening things in the neighborhood that someone's openly operating a business that is illegal and the city seems doesn't seem to be able to do anything about it. Um, you know, meanwhile, if a neighbor's got a broken window, you know, building a safety will be there in a few days ready to bring the hammer down. Um, and so I, I would second the uh, notion that these things need to be uh, commingled. Um, and I would add it to the, um, I, I think that for me, the comments of Mr. Price and Mr. Englander are very linked. There are two things that are going to keep minority businesses out of this. One is a regulatory structure that's so ex expensive that they can't access the capital to get in. The second thing is having to compete with businesses that are not legal and not following the rules. Those things, both those things have the effect of excluding minorities uh, in addition to causing all kinds of mayhem in the neighborhood. And so I think as we put forward uh, this policy, I do think it's important to signal with a bright light uh, to residents uh, that you know this issue of enforcement is gonna be taken away, taken care of in a way that makes sense. Uh, you know, and this, you know, this idea that, oh, they're not licensed, so they're not regulated. I mean, that's, you know, that's just kind of laughable uh, to, to everyday people. Uh, and I think we want to get that across. So any creativity that we can have in that regard, I think would be uh, uh, very useful in this debate. Yeah, this is um, Asha Greenberg from the LA City Attorney's Office. I'm, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm trying to get One second. To we, it's hard to hear. Can you double check the uh, volume? Is that... Someone's on their way? Okay, it's uh, okay, very so hard to hear. Okay, so it's not working. It's on, it, but it's just not it loud enough. It has to come and speak into this one. Maybe it's better? It's a little bit better, but speak right into it. Yeah, like this. Okay. having some technical issues, but um, I'm Asha Greenberg from the city attorney's office in charge of marijuana enforcement, and unfortunately very familiar with the issues that you're speaking about today. Um, the problem that we, of course, encounter is that um, there's just a lot of money to be made. Um, and so regardless of whatever scheme is put into place, the number of regulations, et cetera, there will always be opportunists who will want to open up and make some money. and um, 
it would really help to have some kind of body, whether it's a commission or agency or whatever, that keeps track of how many of these businesses we have in the city. Because, um, you know, if you have a licensing scheme, you can't assume that only those folks are gonna open up. Others are gonna open up as well. And we rely upon the community to tell us who these people are so we can ferret them out. But I agree with um, Councilman that we have a real problem in terms of how soon we can close them. We go through the court process, it takes a long time. And so um, there's not necessarily a perception of the problems that are created in the community and I'm very familiar with the ones that we have um, in um, Southeast Division of LAPD and we're working on them. But um, hopefully we will be able to come up with some way where we can deal with these quicker, better, faster. And what we have in terms of the number of these businesses in the city is just really an estimate because we don't have an agency that keeps track of them. So uh, consequently, we rely upon sure. uh, community members to tell us, LAPD divisions to tell us when there is a problem, but there is no one really in the city who takes ownership of this issue and needs to keep track of all these businesses. Perhaps that's something we can uh, get at uh, with regard to who's keeping track of them. Also, you know, it's, I, I agree with you that there's a lot of money to be made uh, by operating illegally, uh, which is why I just am curious about why we haven't put something in place to make it more costly to operate illegally than it is to operate legally. I, it just seems pretty, o it, it seems rather obvious uh, that if someone's violating their certificate of occupancy on this specific use, it seems like there ought to be a fine commiserate with, or that's greater than their ability to make money and that would take away at least the people that have only financial interest uh, away and it would be a, a way of funding the enforcement going forward. And that has to be imposed by a court and um, so we are at the uh, mercy of the court. Sometimes we're able to negotiate settlements which we think are commensurate with the activity and other times the courts will give them a maximum fine which is a thousand dollars a day um, really, and so sometimes it's just a cost of doing business. So am I to understand you correctly, we cannot impose a fine for violating their certificate of occupancy? Well, for um, mis misdemeanors, we are restricted by state law. Signature? So um, we, we, we tend to, I know we're going in a different direction than just looking at the future, and that's why the idea of uh, coming up and crafting some language or at least a process internally Rewinding the clock a little bit, because I think this is a, a great discussion. We had, um, right after Prop D had passed, um, where we had the height of, I don't know, someone estimated at the 1,800 to 2,000 of these um, storefronts throughout the city of Los Angeles, I think was the number. Uh, in my district, I think we had about 100. Um, and we went and put a task force together and shut them all down, every one of them that was illegal. Uh, I think we ended up with three or four, and they're sort of like whack-a-mole. I mean, even they still pop up, and I think the maximum we've had in the last six months or so is seven, including the four or so that were compliant, and we go after them um, to shut them down. And when we first set up a task force, we did so um, directly with the DA's office. Um, and since that task force was uh, shut down um, for uh, other reasons, and taking every, every, we brought everything in house and in the, in the city attorney's office and with all of our other departments. Um, things, and I'm not sure if they're for legal reasons, I don't believe so from what I've heard, uh, have seemed to slow down and be, it become much more difficult than they were when we were shutting them all down um, pretty quickly. And I'm not sure if we can even have this conversation in open session. Uh, and I think there was an agenda item that we were going to discuss in closed session, but it has to be re-agendized, is my understanding, so we can have that conversation. But I think it, it would make sense to actually have that conversation uh, in closed session to figure out at some point if we can get it agendized, and, and I think this committee would be appropriate, and I'd make that recommendation, to start figuring out and dissecting what is happening in terms of the ability to shut these down. Um, because I think 
uh, Mr. Harris Dawson is spot on to say there's it's so frustrating to have an illegal storefront it's harder to shut one of those down no matter what they're selling in there or even gain access than often it is to um, to do anything else you've got an illegal operator uh, and we can't shut them down and that's very very frustrating you can't explain that to the community and it doesn't matter what kind of crime elements are being brought what they're doing or selling out of there it becomes very very challenging and difficult and to me that 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 doesn't make any sense since we've since we've been able to do it before and so I would ask if we can look to the future and scheduling some kind of closed session meetings particularly since we're going to be opening sort of floodgates and we already know we're going to have problems in okay. response, I, I just want to say that um, I'm aware of the task force you're speaking about and the area in which it um, took place. Um, the law has changed, and, and that's definitely played a role in the enforcement. And so um, we're seeing a move towards um, essentially legalizing. And some folks are kind of, um, I guess, jumping ahead before the laws have actually gone into place. And so we're seeing that in, in the number of businesses that are opening up. But um, in terms of agendizing it for closed session, I defer to um, uh, Assistant City Attorney Kaufman Macias for that. We'll, we'll have to look at that, and then if it's uh, appropriate, we'll, um, we'll advise and bring it back. And I, I just want to go on the record. Before November, in fact, in 2015, so before this thing was even qualified for the ballot, I had 133 dispensaries in my district four of them were Prop D qualified. So, you know, the idea that people are reacting to the law changing, like, that, that just doesn't wash yeah. with, with what you see. Well, what we you did see, see a move street. from the Valley to into the South Bureau. <laughs> All right. So we'll go to public comment now. All public comment is one minute. Check. How's that one, microphone? Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That sounds better now. Better. One, two, three. Yeah, it's better. You know, these are oh, actually this is better now. It's picking up more. Sarah Armstrong, Arnie Abramian, Abramian, Virgil Grant, Donnie Anderson. Welcome. Thank you, sir. I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access, which is in proud partnership with the Southern California Coalition. We are here today to ask the committee to reject numerical caps on cannabis businesses and instead use the method which has worked well for the city for over half a decade, allowing a natural cap to arise based on adherence to sensitive use rules and residential abutment. Imposing artificial caps puts the city in a position which invites litigation. It does not allow the city to the flexibility it needs needs to regulate efficiently. It creates an artificial marketplace, not based on patient or consumer needs, but rather a numerical calculation that is inflexible. It invites a scenario where businesses are concentrated rather than spread evenly throughout the city. Moreover, by limiting businesses based on an artificial cap, you discourage job creation, limit tax revenue, and create an environment which invites the black market to flourish as an artificial cap most likely will not be extensive enough to provide for both medical and recreational use. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for me? Nope. nope. Thank you. Arnie Abramian, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to follow up on the illegal shops. I've been a patient for over 10 years, and illegal shops have been mushrooming all over our communities. On one hand, they all need to be closed down. On another hand, legal shops have been closed down because of false complaints or neighborhood, I call them marijuana Nazis, that just go around filing complaints just because they don't like you, whether it's your race, your color, you're a young you know, individual. My personal take is we should not have caps. It should be regulated, controlled. We're one of the biggest industries in the world, the city of Los Angeles, and we should control it and not allow big money to come in and decide what makes the difference. Setting a cap is really going to destroy the individuals that have fight, been fighting for medical marijuana for the past 10 years and on. Thank you. Question? Thank you. Good morning.
morning, Council. My name is Virgil Grant. Um, I'd like, this is the very reason why it's important that we look forward to Proposition M. Uh, it puts the authority back into the hand of the Council, which was removed by Proposition D. This is why the industry is so out of control. There is no, the reason why there is no enforcement, because there's nothing to enforce. There's no licensing mechanism put into place to shut these illegal shops down. Even these so-called legal shops don't even have licensing. So there are no licensed facilities in the city of Los Angeles. So how do you tell the difference between the two? This is why it's very important to look forward to Prop M that will bring on smart and sensible regulations, a licensing mechanism, and then we can enforce. We can't put the buggy before the horse and enforce first when we don't know what we're in enforcing. Thank you. Thank you. Donnie Anderson? Yes, hi, Council. Uh, my name is Donnie Anderson. I'm from the Southern California Coalition. One of the things that we came together for is to help the city put in the smart and sensible regulations because I'm from uh, District 8, born and raised there 50 years. And we have so many rogue shops in our community, it's a shame. I leave my mom's house at, at, at 10, it's shootings around the corner. We need to put an end to it, but the only way it's going to happen is when the control is back in you guys' hands. We need to make sure that we change this from top to bottom and make sure that minorities is not left out of a new industry that's going to thrive to make California the number one market, whether we want it or not, is here to stay. Or we've been meeting with a lot of other people from big business that can't wait to get in here to take it over. Thank you. Griselda Bonilla, Eric Holstrom, and Robert Velchio. Our value. No, anybody can come on up. I think up. I was put on the wrong one. Four and five. Pardon me? I think I was put on the wrong one. I'm four four. I, I can't hear you. Can you speak into the microphone, please? I was put on the wrong one. The wrong one. Four and five. Okay. Well, can you figure that out with our clerk, please? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Eric Hallstrom, the Southern California Coalition, the president of the Cultivators Alliance. Uh, one thing I guess I would like to say going forward, I know the issues of the shops who are bad actors definitely needs to get dealt with, especially for the good shops. Uh, the other side of it, what I would like to more address is that the other sides of this business, particularly on the production side and the sides that haven't been regulated in any way, even with limit, uh, limited immunity, such as cultivation, manufacturing, and delivery as well, hopefully has like an alternate path forward. It, they're really hasn't been a way to delineate good and bad actors yet with it. So knowing that the production side of this industry is going to make us a juggernaut, potentially I want us to have good export market. So making sure that the transition is smooth for the, the supply side of this industry, which is where the good jobs are located at, is uh, hopefully something that is taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, committee. My name is Robert Vecchio. Um, I'll make it fairly quick. I want to urge you guys to embrace the cannabis industry that's taken hold in our city. We have a tremendous opportunity at our hands, and we really need to be issuing licensing, um, regulating on, on those regulation or on those, um, on those license uh, structures, and then enforcing. Um, so I want to urge you guys not to place artificial caps on the market. Um, this will figure itself out. We want to give the power back to the city council. Um, verging ev or urging everyone to vote yes on M, and um, and we're really hoping that, that you guys embrace this and um, and and make LA the, the center of, of cannabis in the entire world. You know we've got a great opportunity, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay, so we'll. Uh Note and file the city attorney report on Prop D and concur with the planning department as to the preparation of a second report outlining the elements needed to enact marijuana businesses zoning and land use regulatory controls 
and thereby enable the preparation of a draft ordinance with the assistance of the city attorney prior to January 2018. That'll be the motion. And some of the council members made some suggestions um, as to specific elements to look at. And I know that some of those elements uh, are being taken up by IGR, but if they could be brought up in those reports as well, please do so. <coughs> With no objection, so ordered. Thank you. We will now turn to item four and five. We'll take them together. If those could be read into the record, please. Sure. Um, <laughs> item four, Councilman, this is a uh, communication from the Planning Commission. It's a proposed ordinance uh, for the specific plan to the LA Coliseum District and amendments therein. And item five is interrelated in as much as it's a proposed development agreement uh, ordinance between the city um, and USC in a, an amount of 2.5 million. Thank you. Um, we'll hear from staff unless uh, Mr. Price, um, this, these items on your district, you wanna speak after? Okay, no, okay. After. Steph. Um, good afternoon, Sarah Molina Pearson, Department of City Planning. The Coliseum District Specific Plan Amendment and the Development Agreement before you today were approved by the City Planning Commission at its meeting on January 26, 2017. The City Planning Commission took the following actions. Recommended that the City Council adopt a city-initiated specific plan amendment of Section 8C of the Coliseum District Specific Plan to read, the modified Coliseum renovation project shall retain its nat National Historic Landmark designation to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning. The Director of Planning shall report to the City Planning Commission prior to making a final determination. And also recommended that the City Council adopt a development agreement between the University of Southern California and the City of Los Angeles with a combined value of $2.5 million for a term of 10 years. The benefits include $1 million to the Council District 9 to support job training for local residents within a five mile radius of the project, $1,500,000 to Council District 9 to be dedicated for recreation and park capital improvements, green space programming, and or the acquisition of land within the Council District 9 boundaries, and execution of a project labor agreement that sets forth a provision for at least 30% of the total work hours to be performed by local residents. The specific plan amendment and the development agreement will enable USC to provide a $270 million investment for the Coliseum renovation project. The renovation project includes upgrades and facilities that are compatible with the existing architecture of the Coliseum including but not limited to an approximately 25,000 square foot concourse addition within the interior of the Coliseum, a new 17,400 square foot press box with 44 luxury suites, a portion of the North and South Stadium sideline seating bowl will be removed and replaced with a new cast in place concrete seating bowl that will provide a wider seating tread and additional aisles and installation of new seats to replace the existing seating. In addition, the specific plan amendment and the development agreement will allow the city an opportunity to benefit from the renovation of the Coliseum in a manner that is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the general plan and the Coliseum district specific plan while maintaining the National Historic Landmark designation of the Coliseum. Thank you for your time. I am available if you have any questions. Okay, we'll go to uh, public comment now. We'll start off with the applicant, Laurie Stone from USC, and um, five minutes. All the other speakers have up to two minutes. Uh, this is a two item uh, items, so you have a minute per each item. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Laurie Stone, I'm the Associate Senior Vice President of Real Estate at the University of Southern California. In 2013, USC entered into a long-term lease with the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum Commission. That lease gives USC the sole responsibility for the maintenance and operations of the Coliseum, which is owned by the state of California. Under our lease, we have an obligation to make approximately $70 million in repairs and deferred maintenance within the first 10 years of our lease. 
The proposed Coliseum renovation project represents an investment of approximately $270 million that not only takes care of our lease obligation, but also will make important improvements to enhance the fan experience, improve safety, and make sure that the Coliseum remains a viable venue for the city, county, and state, including the important role the, count the Coliseum will play in the 2024 Olympics. USC has a unique history with the Coliseum. Uh, we were on the field when we played the first football game that was played in the Coliseum in 1923, and we have remained the only collegiate and professional team that has played in the Coliseum since that time. Because of our shared history, we have a very different approach to how we look at the Coliseum and how we've proposed our renovation. As a result of that, we invited the Los Angeles Conservancy to meet with us throughout the very uh, early stages and planning stages for the project. As a result, we have a project that we feel uh, is much more respectful to the Coliseum and sensitive to the important historic features. The proposed project makes no changes to the external structure. It will continue to look the same from the outside as it does today. And importantly, the video boards and advertising will be removed from the peristyle, restoring the most iconic feature of the Coliseum to its original condition. The renovation is far less intrusive than previous projects proposed, and the Los Angeles Conservancy has supported the project and submitted a letter in um, support of that to the city. We've also met numerous times with the city's Office of Historic Preservation while designing the project, and we also submitted a letter from LA 2024 demonstrating their support. Uh, as staff mentioned, we have entered into a project labor agreement that will provide for a 30% local hire while the construction is underway. We're also entering into a development agreement that will provide $1.5 million for public parks and $1 million for job training. We have our lounge council, our environmental consultants, and our full team here to answer any questions if you have them. We appreciate your time and we look forward to renovating the Coliseum for all Angelinos. Kevin Ramsey, Andre Gueno, Andrea Canty Tool, Chris Cheek, and Griselda Bonilla. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Ramsey. I'm the owner of a small business, Alameda Construction Services, and I'm also a board member of the National Association of Minority Contractors. And we're in support of the project. USC has been a great partner of the National Association of Minority Contractors, and we look forward to uh, getting the opportunity to bid, work, and get, getting on the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. As a, a resident of South Los Angeles, as well as a local contractor, I'm here in support of the project, particularly in light of the opportunities that are present to local contractors as well as the uh, project labor agreement and the local hire goals. Thank you. And thank you. You're Andre Gueno? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Criselda Bonilla. I live at 1216 West 37th Place. That's basically next to the Coliseum. As a community member and uh, a leader of the community, I'm here to support the project because this will bring uh, jobs to the community that we need. Um, we, they are as much needed. This also will bring more safety to the surrounding area of the Coliseum. We will have the opportunity to have um, the chance so we can be picked uh, to have the Olympic Games uh, in 2024. And uh, personally, I would like to watch uh, my football soccer games and uh, football games in better place and better seats. And just keep on saying that I'm probably saying that I live next to the, to the LA Coliseum. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cheek. I'm with uh, Plumbers Local 78 here in Los Angeles. We support this project. Um, we're looking forward to fulfill the 30% local hire goals in the PLA. Uh, it's going to be great union jobs for residents. Um, it's going to bring them great paying jobs, but not just that, a career. Uh, this project's the first step to bring the Olympics back to LA, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks. Andrea Canty Tool. Yes, hi, good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Andrea Canty Tool, and I have been a member of Council District 8 for over 40 years as a homeowner, and that's where I grew up at. 
I am also the immediate past president of the Empowerment Congress North Area Neighborhood Development Council. I'm here today to speak um, in support of this LA Coliseum renovation project and partnership with USC and the city of Los Angeles. I wanna thank USC um, for their vision and support and their commitment to fundraising to see that this project um, comes to fruition and all of the other investments uh, for our community as well as the students at USC. Many years ago when I was a high school student, I was actually an usher for the USC football games and so I was at that Coliseum for every home game so I know uh, what that facility looks like inside and out. And um, it was a lot of fun uh, working there. Um, also, um, as a student, um, I worked at the Coliseum in the 90, uh, during the 1984 Olympics as a guard outside the Coliseum. And so, um, once again, I was able to um, guard those, those um, grounds during that time, but also um, be invested in the community at the Coliseum. So, needless to say, I've been around the Coliseum for a long time. And uh, this year I've attended two Rams games at the Coliseum, and um, which I'm glad to see that the seats are going to be enlarged because um, I've grown since I was a kid sitting in those seats. And also it was difficult and challenging for me walking with food and drinks from the top all the way down to my seat, which was close to the field, not having any handrails to hold on to. So I'm also glad to see that that's a part of this renovation project. Um, in this past year, I went to the USC Alabama game um, at the Dallas Stadium, and they had handrails, and it was very productive. I thought we were getting two minutes for both items. Those were two minutes, correct? That was two minutes. Yes, and, that was two um, minutes. So anyways, I'm excited to see this project. I'm excited about local hire, and I hope that um, uh, with Steve uh, Weston from USC and the city council that we monitor the 30% local hire and make sure that um, our community members are involved and that we keep it affordable for all of our community okay, members Now it's to at three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Price. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank the neighbors and friends who've come out to testify for this matter. <clears throat> And members, thank you for this opportunity to consider yet another great project in the new ninth. As many of you are aware, Expo Park and the area immediately surrounding the park is experiencing a swell of economic development like never seen before. The USC Village Project, which is going to bring uh, classrooms, uh, office space, a new Target, a new Trader Joe's uh, to the campus. We've got a $350 million uh, LA football club soccer stadium under construction expansion of the Science Center to house the famed Endeavor Space Shuttle, uh, the George Lucas Museum, and the list goes on and on. Today, we consider the renovation of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, which has been a work in progress for several years. After years of negotiation between the city, the county, the state, and USC, USC took over management and operations of the Coliseum for a period of 99 years. In return, USC has pledged to perform a number of much-needed upgrades. If you've been to a recent SC or RAM game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are a number of terms in the agreement which also ensure particular performance metrics and project oversight by the Coliseum Commission, which includes appointees by the mayor, board of supervisors, and governor, to ensure the Coliseum maintains its status as a national historic landmark and also provides the ultimate fan experience in our hopeful bid for the 2024 Olympics. Today's project proposes to remove the large scoreboards on the east end, which will, re will restore the original look of the peristyle, replacing all seating, and in many cases provide wider seats uh, with more leg room and more aisleways. The project is expected to create 500 jobs during the renovation phase, and I'd like to recognize USC for stepping up to the plate to ensure that the local community also benefits from this project. As uh, stated uh, earlier, the development agreement before you today includes a project labor agreement, 30% local hire, a million dollars in job training resources for residents living within five miles of the project site, and 1.5 million for recreation and park acquisition, capital improvements, and programming to the Council District 9 Public Benefits Trust Fund. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm also requesting an amendment to ensure that design regulations and oversight are consistent with the initial planning department report and reflective of the lease agreement between the Coliseum Commission and the University of Southern California to ensure that once the project approvals are obtained from the commission, the project applicant must still receive sign-off from, from the director of planning. Members, again, thank you for your consideration. I ask for your I vote to approve this project, which will restore the shine in the crown jewel of Expo Park. Thank you very much. Um, your uh, suggested amendment was to? Yes, to uh, ensure that design regulations and oversight are consistent with the initial planning department report and reflective of the lease agreement between the Coliseum Commission and USC to ensure that once the project approvals are obtained from the commission, the project applicant must still receive sign-off from the director of planning. Okay. So that was the amendment? And it's in the letter submitted uh, to the commission. In to the, the letter to the commission. To the okay, Correct. we'll make that a motion to uh, approve item four with the sequel findings and the report from the commission uh, and the proposed ordinance for the specific plan amendment. And also item number five to approve the development agreement um, with the amendments incorporated by uh, and mentioned by Mr. Price. Were those clear uh, to our staff? Uh, Councilman, in addition, uh, if you could please request the city attorney to prepare the ordinances, the development agreement ordinance and the specific plan amendment ordinance and read into the record uh, for number four and five, the um, uh, environmental impact report, the first addendum and second addendum, third addendum, and statement of overriding consideration and CEQA findings need to be adopted. Okay, we'll uh, incorporate that into the four motion. Yeah, four and five. Okay. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Congratulations, you, Mr. Thank Mr. Price. You, Thank you, members. Item number seven. Item, item seven, uh, Councilman, this is a report being transmitted from the Planning Commission. It's a zone change and high district change ordinance. It's for a multifamily housing uh, uh, structure with 335 units located in CD3. And in, it also includes a 5% very low income uh, requirement for 17 units. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, honor honorable committee members. My name is Adam Villani. I'm the project planner for this with the Department of City Planning. Uh, this project is located in Woodland Hills. Uh, there is an existing post office on the site and a small office building. Uh, the post office will be vacating the site later this year. Uh, the project is a five-story residential building with 335 residential units, and that includes 17 of them, which is 5%, which would be set aside for very low income households as defined by the state density bonus law. Uh, the city planning commission approved a modification to add an additional nine units uh, for a total of 7.5% uh, set aside for very low income ho households. Uh, and the additional nine units would not be subject to the state density bonus law. Um, and uh, even though the property is located adjacent to the 101 freeway, um, the environmental impact report concluded that there would be no significant impacts. Uh, also, I would like to say that if uh, the committee approves uh, any modifications, that the committee instruct the staff to make any necessary technical corrections to the conditions and findings to implement these modifications. Thank you. You. And staff is available to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Andrew Pennington from CD3. Wish to, we have one public card. Do you want to speak now or after? No? Oh, I can speak now. Okay. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, this is a project located in one of our more affluent neighborhoods in Woodland Hills. Um, we're happy to see that they're providing uh, at least... Um, 7.5% uh, set aside for affordable housing. Um, and we'd also have worked out um, a, another condition that we would like to be um, added 
uh, to the project approval. Um, the applicant has agreed to provide $300,000 uh, for streetscape and transportation improvements in the area. Uh, that will help to better integrate this project into an area that has been predominantly commercial in the past. Um, for those reasons, we are supportive of the project, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Bisno. Thank you. How much time do I have? One minute? Okay. I represent the... Um, I'm sorry. No, I'm not the applicant. You're, you're the applicant? No, I'm not no. the applicant. Okay, one minute. Yeah. Okay. My client is a, uh, has an office building across the street from the post office. Uh, we oppose this project for a number of reasons, mostly due process reasons. Uh, I've sent several letters to the planning department requesting that we be notified of all hearings. They've been acknowledged in the environmental impact report. We were not notified regarding the July 22nd meeting. Most importantly, we're not notified regarding the November 7th planning uh, meeting, which was a critical meeting. Uh, again, there are emails, letters, correspondence, email addresses, myself, Mr. Yellen, who's the president of my client's company, Mr. Sachs. We were not given any notice, and I feel this is really unfair. Uh, since I have limited time, uh, the ingress-egress proposal does not work uh, right now. There is a uh, egress from the post office onto a street, Glade Avenue, that goes right to Ventura Boulevard. That's being eliminated, and I think that's going to cause undue traffic congestion. Thank you. All right, so uh, any questions or comments? Staff? Hi. Uh, Adam, Vellani, Adam Vellani, uh City Department staff, uh, City Planning Department staff. Uh, the speaker is correct in that a hearing notice was inadvertently not mailed specifically to the property owner's legal representative. However, staff re reviewed the administrative record and the property owner themselves were indeed mailed a copy of the hearing notice given that the property owner lives across the street from the pro or given that the property is across the street from the project site. A copy of the hearing notice was also posted on the project site in visible and conspicuous locations. Further, a notice of the subsequent City Planning Commission meeting was also posted on the project site. Since the speaker's uh, associate, Evelyn Zaraga, contacted staff between the City Planning Commission meeting and the issuance of com commission's determination, staff made certain that the property owner's representative received a copy of the CPC determination. Staff further spoke to the representative and indicated that the determination could be appealed and no appeal was filed on the matter. And I would also like to add that in terms of the traffic, the, uh, the traffic analysis determined that the proposed uses would generate fewer trips than the existing measured uses on the site from the post office and small office building. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? So we'll move to adopt the CEQA conditions and zone change ordinance with the recommended amended from Councilmember Blumenfield's office of the condition. C C Councilman, uh, uh, per the advice of the city attorney, we should read into the record the adoption of the EIR, the addendum, the mitigation measures, the mitigation monitoring program, and the CEQA findings, sir, and the erratas. And the additional conditions uh, CD3 requested. Okay, I'm going to call my staff over here to debate with you whether my motion's better than that one. I, I, I defer to you. No. <laughs> I'm glad two of you got it. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll make that motion, okay? Any uh, objections? That includes the amendment by Mr. Blumenfield, okay? All right. Seeing no objections, so ordered. Thank you. That leaves us with public comment. Yes, sir. There's no. Rodrigo Lopez. A 
Rodrigo Lopez here. No. Fatima Murieta. No. Christopher Mooney. Araceli Argueta. Al Farmer. Thomas. Uh, Thomas Carey, you know, I think these are probably for items four and five. They're filed under public comment, but they didn't have a number, right? We should probably ask them if oh, we did and they, and they didn't. Are they, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And Herman? So you heard it. They say that the Coliseum is going to be improved. More broken promises by our elected officials on this planning commission. They continue to make promises like with their mixed use for amenities of having all this use and so forth. And then the best one of it all was one discussed about the medical marijuana or the recreational marijuana. Well, let's go back to Joe Buschiano's area off of Wilmington and Imperial. Why don't you go out there, Mr. Dawson or Mr. Price, and see how goddamn ugly that fucking eyesore of the Rosa Park Station is? Because Joe Buschiano is so fucking white, he don't care about African Americans, and he should be goddamn ashamed to be called a colleague. Herman, this is about uh, it's land about use. planning. So okay. whenever you place medical marijuana or all these bullshit shops... You fuck up our communities. Keep the last second. That adjourns this meeting. Thank you.